So I got two messages. I'm going to preach one today and the next one next Sunday. Again, about the altar of God. I'm going to talk about the preparation of the altar centered around Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem that began what's called Holy Week, leading up to his death, burial, and resurrection. A scripture I've used in previous weeks out of Matthew 23, 19 says from Jesus, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? There's something powerful about the altar of God that needs to be restored to the body of Christ. We need to recapture the truth that God's system of communing between the throne of God in heaven and earth is by means of the altar. That's God's telecommunication port, the altar. Praise the Lord. Now Jesus enters Jerusalem at the beginning of Holy Week called Palm Sunday. We celebrate it today. Seven days before his resurrection from the dead on Easter Sunday, which we will celebrate next week. And it's called Holy Week for a reason. It's because everything that Jesus did that week during those eight days was done specifically to establish himself as our altar. And I want to show you through the scriptures today how that each of the prominent things that Jesus did were to put in place a feature of the altar that he would turn over to us. Now, in Hebrews chapter 13, just to give you a verse, let you know that I got this connection between the Holy Week and Jesus establishing himself as our altar from the Word. So, in Hebrews 13, verse 10 and verse 15, it says, We have an altar from which the priests of the tabernacle have no right to eat. Therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. So there you can see that our altar upon which we offer our praises is Jesus Christ himself. And we, we praise him and declare our allegiance to him through that altar that he is. And so that altar is where business is transacted between God's throne and your life. Praise the Lord. And I, I want you to notice through our first verse that the altar, Jesus said, has the power to make sacred unto God the things that are offered upon it. When things are received by God, offered on the altar, the altar makes them sacred. That's why the altar is Jesus Christ himself. And the more you spend time with Jesus at his altar, the more these things that Jesus did during Holy Week that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point out transform your life. So the things you're about to hear are specifically things that will impact your life and bring transformation, become features of your life, as you go to Jesus at his altar. So Jesus was busy beginning on Palm Sunday with the first thing I want to share that Jesus did was what we call the triumphal entry. And Psalm 24, looking to the day when Jesus was going to enter Jerusalem hundreds of years later, riding on that donkey as they waved palm branches, and the children shouted, Hosanna to the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Looking ahead, the psalmist said in Psalm 24, Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? This is important. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Now, the reason why I believe this is significant, not just to Jesus, but significant to you and I, is because Satan had pressured Jesus 
to moderate and downplay his identity as the Messiah. He used the Jewish leaders to threaten him not to identify himself with God. They threatened to kill him. They challenged him. Jesus knew full well, and he was being warned by his disciples, don't go to Jerusalem. They're threatening to kill you. Why? Because you keep making claims that you're the Messiah. You keep saying what we know to be the truth, but they don't want to hear it. They don't like to hear it. And they're trying to turn the whole city, the whole nation against you. So Jesus, as he thinks about the beginning of Holy Week, and he's, he knows what this week is all about. He knows how it ends. And so he's got to think, how am I going to make my first step? How am I going to enter the city? And so Jesus could have entered through a side door very quietly. Don't want to cause a lot of trouble. Don't want to rile people up, claiming I'm the Messiah. But what did Jesus do? Go get that donkey. I'm going to sit on him. And as I come through the gates, people are going to start shouting that I'm the Messiah. Hosanna to the king who comes in the name of the Lord. The disciples uh, uh, were nervous and the Pharisees went ballistic. They went crazy. They rebuked Jesus while he's riding on the donkey, entering triumphantly as the Son of God, as Messiah. Make your disciples stop this. Make those children shut up. Jesus, what did he say? He said, if they don't praise me, these rocks are going to cry out. Look, you know what Satan is most afraid of regarding you because that's where he raises his fiercest opposition and threats against you and that thing that he's afraid of. The thing that Satan feared most was that Jesus was going to boldly say, I am the king of kings. I am the Messiah. And today in our world, we feel that threatening opposition. Just chill out. Just be cool. You, you don't need to go around with a Bible on your dashboard. Oh, you, you don't need to tell people you're a Christian. You don't, need to, you don't need to pray in Jesus' name at the restaurant. Just tamp it down. Why is Satan doing that? Because we are called to boldly show forth the praises of him who's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Our greatest mission is on the other side of that fierce opposition. Be quiet, chill out. We need to do the very opposite. Hallelujah. The first thing about the altar of Jesus is that it calls us to be bold. And on that altar in fellowship with Jesus, the boldness of Jesus enters into us and we become bold. Hallelujah. In Hebrews 4, the scripture says, So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weakness, for he has faced all of the same testings that we do, yet he did not capitulate. He did not cave in. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it the most. We need to be bold. Come boldly. The altar of God will turn the meekest, weakest individual into a bold testimony for Jesus. Spending time at Jesus' altar strips away the suppression of your identity as Christ's ambassador that the world imposes upon you. If you find yourself saying, oh, I wish I wasn't, I wish I wasn't so timid around unsaved people, and the devil offers you the excuse, well, I really don't know what to say to them. You don't need to know what to say. You know Jesus is Lord. Just let it out. 
Just let it out. Just praise Him. Let them know you love Him. Let them know He is Lord. Let me tell you, buddy, I love Jesus. He is wonderful, and I know that what He's done for me, He'll do for you. you anybody could say that. That's the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. But the world suppresses that in you and I. It's at the altar of Jesus where he offers us the boldness. So let me just wrap up this first point by saying, the more time you spend at Jesus' altar, the more bold you'll become about who you are in him. The second thing that happened was Jesus cursed the fig tree. How many of you remember that? He enters Jerusalem, he sees a fig tree, it's robust, leaves all over it. He goes combing through it looking for figs, he finds no figs. But the Bible says, well, it wasn't the season for figs. And I always thought it was strange. Well, Jesus then cursed the fig tree because there were no figs on it. He said, nobody eats fruit from you from here on out. And the next day, as they walked through Jerusalem with his disciples, they noticed that the fig tree literally was just brown and withered up. It had died. Jesus cursed it. The thing just died. And I always wondered, well, that wasn't fair because why does Jesus expect the fig tree to have fruit on it when it's not the season for fruit? Jesus wasn't making an example of the natural trees that depend on worldly cycles. He was making an example for we who are the trees of righteousness planted by the rivers of water, who bring forth their fruit not only in their season, but in God, that season's 12 months out of the year, 365 days of the year. Hallelujah. Jesus cursed the fig tree because it was dependent upon and limited to earthly seasons. But those of us who feed at his altar, we are not to be limited to earthly seasons but we are to be heavenly rooted. So the point about this second thing that Jesus did that he wants us to know about his altar is that the more time you spend at Jesus' altar, the more he makes you fruitful under fruitless conditions. For you, there is no excuse. For you, there is no time. There is no winter. There is no dead season. There is no downtime. For you at Jesus' altar, you are always expected to bring forth fruit. Amen. Number three, Jesus cleansed the temple. At the very beginning of his ministry, he goes into the temple and he drives out the money changers. He says, you've made my father's house a den of thieves. Get out. And now at the very end, this last week, Holy Week, once again, he goes in. Now, he had been back to the temple several times. But why did he do it this time? Because he was putting something in place in the altar, in Jesus' altar. It had to do with the cleansing of this temple. Now, this is a little complex, and I've made it as simple as I can for you. There are many illustrations to squeeze out of Jesus cleansing the temple. And I'm not going to bother going through them all, but there is one that applies to the altar. The simplest explanation for Jesus cleansing the temple as it relates to us today is simply this. The temple had corrupted its purpose of prayer by providing a means of worship for people who came unprepared. Just let that sink in. The temple had created a system by which they profited, by providing the means to offer up to God worship for people who came unprepared. Now, the problem is that Jesus sees that system as robbing the true purpose of the altar. Nobody should be doing your praising for you. Nobody should be doing your worshiping for you. Are you hearing me? Amen. You are called to come to his altar and you are to boldly offer your own worship to God. He doesn't want something you rented from somebody else. He doesn't want... You to just get in where other people are praising the Lord and you just let their praise be offered up on your behalf. 
The altar is for all of us to offer ourselves. Remember the verse that I shared with you. Let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. So I would wrap up this third point by saying, the more you spend time at Jesus' altar, you're going to love this, the less you'll need a praise team to do your worshiping for you. I wish we could just stand here and just praise God about that. But we have to move on. Number four, the Olivet Discourse. During the week on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sat down with his disciples and he gave them a detailed prediction of his return and of the destruction of the evil in the world. And he began that discourse. You can find it in Matthew 24 and Matthew 25. He opened it up. His first opening words were, don't let anyone mislead you. Everything he was going to say about his return and the end of the world and the destruction of the nations and the rise of the Antichrist, all of that, he, he cradled it in that first supporting foundational thought. Let nobody mislead you. Why did Jesus say that? What, what was his point in warning us? Fast forward now, instead of the disciples sitting 2,000 years ago talking to him, here we sit in 2023. The world is on fire. The gates of darkness have been thrown open. Hell is unleashed. And Satan is setting his table all over our world. Now is when this warning speaks to us. In other words, don't let yourself be taken in by what the world is doing. Let no one deceive you. And then he explains about what's coming. You see, Jesus' altar is a light that always points to his return. It's not just an altar where we go to get groceries. It's not just an altar where we go for healing. It's not just an altar where we go for temporary comfort. But it's a long view. It's got an eternal focus. Jesus' altar is a beaming light aiming at Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. That altar of Jesus, when you spend time in prayer, spend time at Jesus' altar, he won't allow you to be overwhelmed by the fears that the world's evil is going to continue unconquered and unchecked. He will always remind you, if you'll stay there long enough, if you'll stay in his presence long enough, Jesus will remind you of his return. He will begin to, he'll begin to um, deal with all the issues that are happening right now by reminding you that eventually he will come and the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. The king is coming. Hallelujah. The king is coming. Why can I be bold? Why can I be brave? Because my king is coming. It, I don't care how the heathen rage and how they carry on. I know they are going to fail. All of them and every bit of it is going to fall apart. Jesus is coming, hallelujah. So the more you spend time at Jesus' altar, the more he focuses your faith on his victorious return as the king of kings at the head of heaven's armies. I love that, don't you? People that don't spend time in Jesus' altar have lost sight that he is coming. Number five. The night of the Last Supper. Number five, communion with Jesus, the last Passover. At the last Passover supper with his disciples, Jesus opened the communion table. Do you see what he did? They had a Passover meal, and then Jesus took those elements of the Passover meal, and he opened the doors to something totally new. He opened the doors to the altar of God, and he said, I'll always be here. This is my body. This is my blood. 
you'll always find me here. Hallelujah. What was the very last thing Jesus did with his disciples? He sat down at the communion table and he opened up the altar. He said, you can always find me here. No matter what you're going through, no matter what happens in the world, you will find me in my altar. Come to my altar and have fellowship with me. Praise the Lord. And the fact that it was the last thing that Jesus did with his disciples... And he even said, he said, for so long, I have been looking forward to having this meal with you. Because he knew he was going to take it beyond the Passover. He was going to open up the altar for communion with himself. He said, I long for this. I long to do this with you and to establish this altar. Because I see through the years to come how I will have intimate communion with millions of people saved and redeemed who will in turn go from my presence out into the world and destroy the works of darkness and spread my kingdom. Hallelujah. So I would say this about this fifth point. The more you spend time at Jesus' altar, the more you'll be refreshed by communion with him. So many Christians say I'm dry. How come you haven't been in church? Oh, I'm just dry. I mean, it's like getting hit by a car when you're crossing the street and the ambulance comes and they roll you onto the stretcher and you're like, hold on, where are you taking me? Oh, I'm taking you to the hospital. I can't go to the hospital looking like this. I, I just want to go home. But you need to go to the hospital. We need communion. We need to come into the presence of God. We need to pray. That dryness, we let it drive us away from the things of God. We get dry. What does it lead to? More dryness. Amen. Mm -hmm. right. Come to that altar. Find communion with Jesus. Finally, the sixth thing that happened that week was Jesus was crucified. There's so much we could say. But I want to just offer this simple thought. In Hebrews 10.10 10, it says... And by God's will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Whew. Hallelujah. Now here's what is significant about coming to the altar today. There can be no alternate outcome. You could see that in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus wrestled. Is there an alternate outcome? No. The Lamb of God must offer himself. There's no, there's no alternate path. You must offer yourself. You must lay your life down. You must offer yourself up. And so therefore, offering ourselves on Jesus' altar is mandated by his crucifixion. We can do nothing less. You see, we receive a Jesus. We come to an altar where the Lamb of God gave all. When you come to that altar where the Lamb of God gave all, you can't do anything less. You're supposed to give all. You cannot hold back. He didn't hold back. You can't hold back. And if Jesus, the perfect Son of God, had to drop down on his knees praying till, till sweat, begin to leak blood from his forehead. Lord, is there another way? Don't feel ashamed or feel bad if you don't want to offer your all. If the thought of giving your all scares you to death and, and you just feel like, I can't do it. Remember, Jesus felt the exact same way. But he pushed through. And the Bible says an angel came down and ministered to him and strengthened him. And then he got up and he marched into that trial and straight to Calvary's cross. Our offering of ourselves is mandated by Jesus' crucifixion. The altar of Jesus will always demand that you give yourself, that you offer yourself, that you hold nothing back. If you do, then the benefits of Jesus giving himself fully to us 
will come to you. They will be yours. I think there's more Christians that come up short with the blessings that the Lord wants to give them because they won't give themselves totally. We are in a blood covenant. We could do nothing less. Hallelujah. If we want all from Him, we must give all to Him. The seventh and final thing that happened that week was the resurrection. But we're going to save that for next week. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And so at Jesus' altar, what are the six things that comprise His altar? Well, the more time you spend in Jesus' altar, the more bold you will be about who He has made you. The more time you spend at Jesus' altar, the more He makes you fruitful under fruitless conditions. The more you spend time at Jesus' altar, the less you'll need a praise team to do your worshiping for you. The more you spend time at Jesus' altar, the more He focuses your faith on His victorious outcome. That's what lies ahead. It doesn't end with what the world says. And the more you spend time at Jesus' altar, the more you'll be refreshed by communion with Him. And the more you spend time at Jesus' altar, the more He empowers you to offer yourself. Hallelujah. Stand with me this morning.